You see, dear brothers, dear sisters, I have found that in the present day Christianity, it's possible to do church and to do your Christian life without Jesus. And it will look like you are still with him. It will look like everything is still the same way it should be. I go around, you know, uh, just, just this weekend, I came back from a long trip in the South. It began on Saturday, came back on Sunday evening. I meet young people. Sometimes people cry in meetings. They cry. They roll. They weep. I've been there too. I remember one meeting back on campus. It was a worship meeting. Powerful that night. I still remember what I was wearing. I remember the jeans. I remember the t-shirt. I rolled on the floor crying. Anybody that would have seen me that day would have said, Kai, how he loves Jesus. In fact, as I was walking to my hostel, I was skipping, singing sweet songs to the one whom my heart loves. But I got to the hostel. I was staying in what you call a semi-self-contained. It's two rooms. Those people in Delta State University will know that place. It's Emu Hostel. Anybody from Delta? My brother? Uh -huh. Emu Hostel. They call it semi-self-contained. So two rooms sharing toilet, kitchen, and bathroom. So in our own room, we were, we were four brothers three brothers in their own room, there were three sisters, girls. Not family related, but three girls were staying here, three boys were staying here. Me and my roommates, Han and roommates. And meanwhile, one of the girls in that room, I had noticed over a period that I had begun to have a reaction towards her. And I was fighting it in the place of prayer. That day that I came back from worship, as I was about to climb the stairs to enter the room, I noticed her room door open. And there was light everything within my being said Kesena, enter your room but you see I said let me just go and greet so I entered there and I rested on the table I just rest my back and there was just a candlelight she was sprawled on the bed. I'm giving you details so that you understand what I'm saying. She was sprawled on the bed in her nightgown. It was evening. I was just coming from night. I was just coming from fellowship. And the way the candle cast a shadow. Ravi no course. You see, before you judge David, make sure you, you can survive what he survived. And then I said hello and greeted her. And was about to take my leave. And she said, what are you doing there now? Come. And you see, I lie not to you. Till today. If you ask me how I left that table. And got to that bed, I don't know how. And I'm not exaggerating. God is my witness. I just know that I was once here. <laughs> and I found myself there. But that's not the whole story. At this time, I was already leading morning devotions in that hostel. Yes. 5, 6 a.m., I'm the one on the field. Crowds gather. They knew me as a man of God. In, it was during when I lead morning devotions that they knew that people could cry in morning devotions. I taught morning devotions and cultists. I was a cultist myself before I got saved, before I rededicated my life. I saw confra people come and meet me in the room and say, what you said today. I was already leading morning devotions with power, with grace, without microphone. Early hours of the morning, everybody that was on my block would hear my tongues rattle. I must do it two hours before I step out. It was the same me as we were doing royal rumble on the bed, getting ready to do the, the, the devil's work. I was the one that said, I whispered to her, they will catch us. They will catch us. Uncle, if they are going to catch us, is it not to get up and lock the door? Because by the time I walked in and got to her, the door, it was just the curtain. So the reasonable thing would have been, let us lock the door. But you know what I said? Let's go outside. They will catch us. Let's go outside. So we came out and went behind the hostel. And like a dog, I had sex with her. Not knowing that the neighbor opposite watched the whole movie from beginning to end. From beginning to end. 
This is the story. The next morning, I got up as usual. And then I wanted to ascend. I lay on my bed and I sought for the one whom my heart loves. And I found him not. I tried. Cool, cool. Normally, this is the way God designed my work with him. If I start praying here, I can shut you out for four hours. And it will come like oil. My transitions are smooth. They are quick. Except there's something troubling me. Smooth, quick. I tried. I tried. I couldn't break through. Then the brother from the other room just came. Opened the curtain and said, Kai! Pastor, you're too much. Tears fell from my eyes. If your life does not match what you claim comes from your heart, your life is a lie. And you see, I find out, especially amongst young people, our living is a lie. We claim to love the bridegroom, but it is not him we love. We love his activities. We are in love in singing songs of ascension, but we don't love him. His presence has not become valuable to us to the point where anything that fights our intimacy with God, we now treat as an enemy. No. Do you know that prayer itself can become an idol? That even you now elevate the length of prayer more than what it is that prayer is supposed to give you. That people go about priding themselves about how long they pray. Meanwhile, prayer is not a successful enterprise because you prayed long. It's a successful enterprise because of what happened to you when you prayed. The journey of prayer is supposed to be transformational. Because prayer is you making contact with God. So if you are consistently making contact with God, it should affect you. Your appetites should change. Your outlook to life should change. Your appetites, your passions, your desires, your likes should change. So how is it that you claim to be making consistent contact with God and your greed is as fresh as the day you met him? Your pride is still untouched. Your lust grows by the day. Now we can't even trust two Christians in courtship anymore. We can't trust them. Christians are using courtship now to hide sexual immorality. Our sisters have become endangered species, not outside, in the church. Sometimes tears fall from my own eyes when, I, when sisters share with me the things they go through from pastors. Bible study teacher. Two Wednesdays ago, a young lady walked into service. And then after prayer meeting, she came to me. She said, I needed to see you. I have lost confidence in myself, lost faith. My spiritual life is in tatters. And once a sister starts talking like that, I know what the issue is. It was one of the leaders in fellowship. Who she went to? She went to submit herself for mentorship. The organa took an occasion to touch breast and molest the sister. The sister was so shocked that when the thing was happening, she didn't know what to say. Now went and started blaming herself. Maybe it's me. Maybe it's me that did not do one thing. Meanwhile, if this brother holds microphone to lead prayer, it will seem like God came. You know what I told myself over the years? What I told myself over the years is, the pulpit eh, is God that determines what he will do. Hmm? There can be somebody in the congregation so desperate for God so desperate for God that God will just take advantage of that, that false individual. He will just use the person as a potter just so he can meet that person. But it doesn't mean he validates that man's life. So a, a, a chronic fornicator can prophesy and he will be accurate. Not because God places a seal on his life but because there's someone he needs to meet and he needs to take occasion that individual. That's why my private life is more important to me than pulpit ministry. You don't know how I beg God. 
before I came to teach you. I, because me, I know, I know myself that if it's to teach something, I can find something to teach. I can come here now and talk to you for four hours and then we strike the keyboard, power will come. I can do it. But the question is, what does the Lord want to say to you? And the Lord was telling me that he sent me to a few people this morning and the question is, how did you become separated from the bridegroom? How did it happen? How come you are looking for him everywhere? Don't you know where you normally used to find him? Lovers have places where they know that if I go there, he will be there. They have secret hangouts. They have codes that they used to communicate. I need to ask a young man here, how come you've gone so far and yet it has been without Jesus? Where did you become separated from him? And you know the thing I'm speaking about, the reality I'm speaking about is that the bride can be going on as if everything is okay. Some people have gotten to a point where they no longer know what is missing. They can't tell. They just know that the Christian life has become mechanical. They know all the phrases. They know how to dress and look like a believer. But that juice, that sweetness, that thing I was trying to find that money, the, the people who know what I'm talking about know what I'm talking about. When you lose that thing, it's very hard to get it back. I get messages from around the world and many times the cry is, Rev! I messed up. I lost God. And now I've been crying to get it back. It's been years. I'm not the same. Marriages, huh? when you've been betrothed to the bridegroom and you attempt to defile yourself with a stranger, you will never come back the same. Never. That's how prayer lives have been lost. That's how people have disqualified themselves from the agenda of God. Bro, forgiveness is a small thing in the eye of God. In the matter of the bridegroom and the bride, forgiveness is a small matter. He will forgive you. I know as evangelists, we talk about the God of a second chance. I stopped saying that many years ago. Because I found out by my own personal experience that God is not the God of a second chance. Do you know how many second chances I blew? How many times I lay down and say, give me a second chance. I'm going to say, take. I blew it. I came back for a second chance. So I found out by experience that it's the God of another chance and another chance and another chance. But you will get to a point, and this is why Paul said, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? It will get to a point that God will forgive you, but he can't use you for anything serious. He can't commit anything that is kingdom into your heart. So the matter is not forgiveness. The matter is ordination. It's destiny. It's destiny. He will forgive you. He loves you. There's nothing you can do to make him love you less. There's nothing you can do to make him love you more. We don't pray because we want God to love us. We pray because we love God. Our praying, our, our, our routines around our Christian faith are driven by a sense of love. That obligation we have is because we love God. We have seen the way he loves us. And that love from God has elicited, has drawn a deep sense of love and reverence. So we engage in those things. Not to make God love us, but to show God that because of the way we feel about him, we have decided to order our lives in a certain way. So the matter is not forgiveness. In just in case you, are, you keep hearing the voice of guilt in your ear, it's not Jesus. It's Satan. The voice of condemnation is Satan. He will forgive you. But the matter is, can he continue with you on the matter of destiny? Can he entrust anything serious into your hand? If something as little as, my son, television is your right, but I don't want it for you. You cannot even sacrifice that for the one whom you claim to love. How can he commit anything serious into your hand? What is the message of Songs of Solomon chapter 3? The Bible says that she was lying on top of her bed asleep. And then she sought the one whom she loves. I sought him, but I did not find him. This is the burden that has been on my heart. And I want to trust the Holy Spirit that I can communicate it. By night on my bed, I sought the one I love. I sought him, but I did not find him. 
The question is, how did she become separated from the one she loves? This is a cry of one whose heart or whose life has become separated from that divine intimacy and union of love. I sought him, but I did not find him. On my bed, I sought him. The bed is the place of intimacy. It's the place where man and wife, these are two lovebirds. He should not have left without her being aware. If she was not expecting to find him on where she was, she would not have begun to seek him. This gives the imagery that she came to the normal place where she expected to find the love of her life. But when she arrived, she sought him but did not find him. Verse 2. She now said, I will rise now and go about the city. In the streets, in the squares, I will seek the one I love, but I sought him, but I did not find him. How come the one, she, is it that he was hiding from her? Where did this separation occur between bride and bridegroom? The worst thing that can happen to a believer is that you are alive, but you are living without his presence. You and God have nothing. Nothing deep, nothing secret, nothing intimate. And you see, you can still be holding mic. You can still be attending church. You can still be doing mighty things. Meanwhile, he's only using you to satisfy a need on the heart of people. He's not willing to share himself with you. She sought for him. The thing I like about the Shulamite is, at least when she noticed he was missing, you know what she was doing, bro? She was going to the last places where she saw him. So she went to the cities. We were here some time ago. But eventually he returned here and I did not know. She went into the streets. He was here some time ago. But eventually he returned here and I did not know. When she could not find him, then she went to the watchman and said, is it possible that you saw my beloved. Is it possible that you saw him? He said, we didn't see him. Luckily, the Bible says, go to verse 4 now. Verse 4. Scarcely had I passed by them when I found the one I love. Look at her response. I held him and I will not let him go. Where did she bring him back? Into the secret. And I had brought him to the house of my mother and into the chamber of her you see don't let this conference pass and you are not back in the chamber with, with the bridegroom as great as public manifestations and expressions are what you have with God in the secret is the true condition of your Christian life what you have with him in the secret what you and him share this is why the bridegroom metaphor is used. It's an intimate metaphor. There are things I, I will share with my wife. I will never tell you on the pulpit. It's between me and my wife. Never. There's no way the spirit will move. Even God will not allow me to share with you. There are things that are too intimate to be publicly shared. Even as examples. They cannot be used. If you don't have such things with the Lord, then I'm trying to say to you that you're not yet a bride being prepared. Being prepared. The bridegroom wants more from you than your public appearances. He wants more from you than what others see you to be. He wants to see you just the way you are and know that there is nothing hidden. There is nothing covered. Hmm? At this point, she had tasted a little of what it meant to lose the bridegroom. So that immediate understanding of the pain that she felt is what led her to do this. I've seen people fall under conviction and cry. I knew a young lady that once the power begins to move, she's the first to fall. And there's nothing wrong with falling under the anointing. People fall under the anointing. As the Spirit of God moves, people will fall under the anointing. When we pray for people in the night, people will be full of the Holy Ghost. There will be the release of power. There's nothing wrong. My problem was every time she got up, she went back to the same things. 
She went back to sexual immorality. Went back into every kind of thing. Recently, a young girl who the Lord told me that um, I woke up, I think it was into the new year, and as I just sat with the Lord, the Lord gave me a list of people. He said, from henceforth, you are paying their school fees till they graduate. So I should, told my wife, I don't know how we're going to do it, but God has said we should do it, we'll do it. So one of them, her school fees is in the range of, she's in the higher institution, 300 and something thousand per semester. You know, in other institutions, they pay per session. This one, they pay per semester. Yes. So, one of the seasons, I began to feel a weight upon my soul. So, found out that she was engaged in some things, and then she took off from school and went to a boy's house. And then the Lord struck my heart that she not did school. So I began to ask questions. I called some other people I knew in the school. Then I now called herself to give her an opportunity to say, Daddy, I have messed up. Just to be upfront. She lied straight to my face. My body is. How can somebody be around the environment of God and still have an appetite for what Satan is selling? Hmm? How can you be in a marriage with a good man and be yearning for what an imposter is offering you? Have you not heard people say, how can this woman be in this marriage and she's cheating? You know that it is not money that is the problem. The man has money. He's spending on her. It's not comfort. Comfort is available. What is it in sex? You now know it's not sex, it's a spirit. That's what the Bible calls another spirit. I've seen so many strange, a young man will tell you, I love God, but my only weakness is masturbation. Oh God, that love is not strong enough to kill that appetite. Who did you meet? Did you, are you sure you met the bridegroom? Are you sure that your love your love for him is really true. You met the bridegroom. You saw him in all his beauty. And yet, something as flimsy as masturbation still has a hold on your life. So when she found him, she will not let him go. That's what some people do in public meetings. You will see them crying. They let Jesus just appear now and say, you've graduated since you are looking for a job. I have a job for you. Go and tell your parents. You are of age. You are 31. You are not a baby. Go and tell your parents that God has said that he's sending you to Zamfara as a missionary. And you had first class in mechanical engineering. Then we will know whether your love is true or is a lie. You know when Reverend Oyeeks was speaking last night, the, the media guys were so good it was so intense. We felt it where we were. So intense. They will switch to a sister that is weeping. Then they will switch back to the message. I said, Kai, they don't finish us. <laughs> it was so intense. Intense. After the weeping will come action. You know what I found out? Every time you make serious commitments, God will now come with a test. Because the commitments is, are not words, they are living. It's your response to the test that will determine whether your commitment was true. Not the tears that you cried. Your response to the test. Can God tell you to go and die? You know, if he tells you, go to Zamfara, then you now put your ear to hear, how long? He will not answer. You know, it's easy to go and tell your parents, God has said I should be in Zamfara for a while. I'll just be there for two years, then I'll be back. You'll give them hope. But God won't tell you how long. You are there for ten years. You become black. That you will be like the scripture spoke about Jesus. That when they look upon you, there is nothing to be desired. Even the sister you wanted to marry, when you do video call, she said, <gasps> and she remembered that she's a child of God. She said, all is well. <laughs> At that point, you will realize that when you come to church and sing, spend my life, God is not joking. She held him. She will not let him go. Can you imagine that thing happening? This thing was happening on the road. So people that would have been passing would say, God, I 
how she loves him. As if that was not enough, she carried him into the bedchamber of her mother as a seal, as a public show that what I'm feeling in my heart is not just in my heart. I want to be with you forever. Come and be part of my family. Dragged him into the secret. Then she began to give us counsel. Say, oh, daughters of Jerusalem. What I just experienced is not a joke. Do not awaken love. It's in that verse 5 that I got all the things I'm telling you. Until it is time. You know what she was saying? I started a relationship I was not ready for. I began a journey without counting the cost. I began to build intimacy with one that I thought was frivolous. I thought that he's just like every other person. I said, do not, don't, don't make the mistake I made. When you enter this thing with the bridegroom, he's not a joker. He cannot share you with another. He will demand for everything. Everything. I was speaking with one of my sons that God just greatly blessed, gave him a job in total. I was speaking with him yesterday and counseling him. I've seen young men drown. Drown. I was in the oil industry for years on the field before I came to lecture. I saw Dickens. We would go for training. Training. Dickens. Confirmed Dickens in church. We would go for training. They would smuggle a, a, a sister into their bedroom. Married men. One like that. I couldn't stand it because his room was just by my own. I came out and I opened the door. I saw the lady sprawled on the bed. I looked at him. I said, you are a Dickens. Grown man, older than myself. All his children are teenagers at that time. So you are a dickin. The pain in my heart was so... I didn't know what... I said, you are a dickin. You will think that when you tell him that his, his libido will die. He couldn't wait to get rid of me. Bolted the door. Because it's another spirit. Do not stay up and awaken love until it pleases. Because in these matters, God is the one that is initiator. He comes to you. He pours his love on you. He uses his love to draw you. Hoping that when you experience his love, then the bride will give herself. Ask married people. You can pay your wife's bride price. You cannot buy her love with money. Ask them. When she enters your house, she will see the love that you share. It's on the basis of what you give. That love will break forth from her vessel. Like a sweet ointment. You can't buy it. You can't force it either. So God is the initiator. He begins the process. So the beloved apostle says, we love you because you first Thank you for watching and if this video has blessed you, please like, kindly subscribe and also tap on the notification bell so you can stay notified and updated on our new videos. And please do not forget to share the link to people so we can bless more people. And most importantly, we want to know how this video has blessed you under the comment section. Don't forget to subscribe.